Hello, we are broadcasted from in the basement at an undisclosed location. Outrage. That word is tossed around a lot. Outrageous. Blackface. Karens being Karens. Outrageous. War in the Ukraine. Outrageous. Buy a latte. Asked for it extra hot and received it lukewarm. That is beyond outrageous, K.M. Hemmings. A lukewarm latte? Indeed, narrator. Outrage is in. Just look at Twitter. As is cancel culture. We love you, Will Smith. Cancel Will Smith. Take his granny. Tell his granny. He is a fanny. Oh my god, he's in rehab. Let's hope that you don't push him over the edge. He has been prone to suicidal thoughts. Calm down, Cam Hemmings. Sorry, narrator. I get carried away sometimes. Why all the outrage? Why all the anger? People seem angrier and angrier. It's something I notice. Even I feel it sometimes. Why it is because people are frustrating, Cam Hemmings. Elaborate, narrator. Flesh out your thoughts. That's a lot of pressure, Cam Hemmings. The channel is named after you. Are you asking me to do your job? Will I get credit for that? Can we call the channel Cam Hemmings and narrator? Come on now, narrator. Don't be an opportunist. You're already on the team. That does it sound like a yes, Cam Hemmings. Go ahead and extrapolate my thoughts for me. I know that was your plan to begin with. You're not fooling me, K.M. Hemmings. Indeed, narrator. I will skip the back and forth for the sake of expediency. Outrage is good. It is necessary. It is a natural response to a terrible reality. This is why outrage must be controlled. Ask yourself, what bothers you now? The war in the Ukraine? Those Russians? The anti-vaxxers? The anti-maskers? Bill Gates? The Illuminati? Those Muslims taking over our country? Or is it the Republicans? The Democrats? The liberals? The conservatives? The left and the right? What is causing your outrage? Whatever you responded, what is the solution? Who should fix this problem? Who is responsible? The government, Cam Hemmings. Our elected leaders. Bingo, narrator. You are a brilliant, digitized voice. Thank you, Cam Hemmings. We look to our leaders to solve our problem. We deputize them to do this work. And as long as we voted for them, we feel that they are doing a good job. They speak nice words, big words, fancy words about human rights, working people, and decent citizens. These words make us feel good and make them look noble. Wisdom is a great gift and knowledge a greater blessing. To know events in history is a gift, but to understand them is a blessing. I know some history, as do you, my precious audience. But I must ask you, do you understand that history? Do you? Our leaders are not from space. They are from us, and therefore they are like us. And what they have done is as outrageous as us, but on an institutional level. Bobby is seven years old, but this is not the first time he has been subjected to electric shock. It's his third time. In all, over the next year, Bobby will experience eight electrical shock sessions. Placed on the examining table, he is held down by two male attendants, while the physician places a solution on his temples. Bobby struggles with the two men holding him down. But his efforts are useless. He cries out and tries to pull away. One of the attendants tries to force a thick wedge of rubber into his mouth. He turns his head sharply away and cries out, Let me go, please. I don't want to be here. Please let me go. Bobby's physician looks irritated and she tells him, Come on now, Bobby. Try to act like a big boy and be still and relax. Bobby turns his head away from the woman and opens his mouth for the wedge that will prevent him from biting through his tongue. He begins to cry silently, his small shoulders shaken, and he stiffens his body against what he knows is coming. Mary is only five years old. She sits on a small, straight back chair, moving her legs back and forth, humming the same four notes over and over, her head framed in a tangled mass of golden curls. For the first three years of her life, Mary was thought to be a mostly normal child. Then after, she began behaving oddly. She had been handed over to a foster family. Her father and her mother didn't want her any longer. She had become too strange for her father, whose alcoholism clouded any 
awareness of his young daughter. Mary's mother had never wanted her anyway and was happy to have her placed in a home. When the LSD Mary has been given begins to have its effects, she stops moving her head and legs and sits staring at the wall. She doesn't move at all. After about 10 minutes, she looks at the nearby physician observing her and she says, God isn't coming back today. He's too busy. He won't be back here for weeks. From early 1940 to 1953, Dr. Loretta Bender, a highly respected child neuropsychiatrist practicing at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, experimented extensively with electroshock therapy on children who had been diagnosed with autistic schizophrenia. In all, it has been reported that Bender administered electroconvulsive therapy to at least 100 children, ranging in age from 3 years old to 12 years old. Inclusive of Bender's work, electroconvulsive treatment was used on more than 500 children at Bellevue Hospital from 1942 to 1956, and then at Creedmoor State Hospital Children's Service from 1956 to 69. Dr. Bender was a confident and dogmatic woman who bristled at criticism, oftentimes refusing to acknowledge reality even when it stood starkly before her. Despite publicly claiming good results with electroshock treatment, privately Bender said she was seriously disappointed in the after effects and results shown by the subject children. Indeed, the condition of some of the children appeared to have only worsened. One six-year-old boy, after being shocked several times, went from being a shy, withdrawn child to acting increasingly aggressive and violent. Another child, a seven-year-old, following five electroshock sessions had become nearly catatonic. Years later, another of Bender's young patients who became overly aggressive after about 20 treatments, now grown, was convicted in court as a multiple murderer. A 1954 scientific study of above 50 of Bender's electroshock patients conducted by two psychologists found that nearly all are worsened by the treatment and that some had become suicidal after treatment. One of the children studied in 1954 was the son of well-known writer Jacqueline Susan, the author of the best-selling novel Valley of the Dolls. Susan's son, Guy, was diagnosed with autism shortly after birth and when he was three years old, Dr. Bender convinced Susan and her husband that Guy could be successfully treated with electroshock treatment. Guy returned home from Bender's care a nearly lifeless child. Susan later told people that Bender had destroyed her son. Guy has been confined to institutions since his treatment. To their credit, some of Dr. Bender's colleagues considered her use of electroshock on children scandalous, but few colleagues spoke out against her, a situation still common among those in the medical profession, said Dr. Leon Einsberg, a widely respected physician and true pioneer in the study of autistic children. Children. Dr. Loretta Bender claimed that some of these children recovered because of her use of electroshock treatment. Chapter 2 Sarah Ann Johnson had always known the broad strokes of her maternal grandmother's story. In 1956, Velma Orlikow checked herself into a renowned Canadian psychiatric hospital, the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, hoping for her help with postpartum depression. She was in and out of the clinic for three years, but instead of improving, her condition deteriorated and her personality underwent jarring changes. More than two decades passed before Johnson and her family had an explanation, and it was much stranger than any of them could imagine. In 1977, it emerged that the CIA had been funding experiments in mind control, brainwashing at the Institute as part of a North America-wide project known as MK Ultra. It was almost impossible to believe, said her granddaughter Sarah. After her grandmother died, the Canadian artist began reading up on the Institute, delving into early calls, journals, and court documents. Some of the things he did to his patients are so horrible and unbelievable that it sounds like the stuff of nightmare. Patients were subjected to high-voltage electroshock therapy several times a day, forced into drug-induced sleeps that could last for months, and injected with megadoses of LSD. After reducing them to a childlike state, at times stripping them of basic skills such as how to dress themselves or tie their shoes, Cameron would attempt to reprogram them by bombarding them with recorded messages for up to 16 hours at a time. First came negative messages about their inadequacies followed by positive ones, in some cases repeated up to half a million times. 
He couldn't get his patients to listen to them enough, so he put speakers in football helmets and locked them on their heads. They were going crazy, banging their heads into walls, so he then figured he could put them in a drug-induced coma and play the tapes as long as he needed. Years later, Johnson found out that the experiments had wreaked havoc on Oliko's brain. It could take her three weeks to read a newspaper, months to write a letter, and years to read a book. But she kept trying. She kept trying to be her old self and do the things that she used to love. Similar scenes played out across Canada as former patients of the Institute attempted to return to their lives. It tainted our whole family, said Allison Steele whose mother was admitted to the institute in 1957. Her mother was 33 years old at the time, reeling from the loss of her first child and showing signs of depression. Back at the time, this Dr. Cameron, he was this miracle psychiatrist, said Steele. He was supposed to do wonders with people with depression or mental health issues. Steele's mother, Jean, was put into chemically induced sleep once for 18 days and a second time for 29 days. She was subjected to rounds of electroshocks, injections of experimental drugs, and seemingly endless bouts of recorded messaging. They say it was torture for human beings. Human torture said Steele, who was four years old when her mother was hospitalized. What they attempted to do was erase her emotions and strip her of her soul. After three months at the Institute, her mother returned home. The treatments had taken a toll on her memory and left her riddled with nervousness and anxiety. She wasn't able to talk to me about life and regular stuff. She wasn't able to joke and laugh, said Steele. Miron, the psychiatrist behind the experiment, died in 1967 of a heart attack while mountain climbing. Recent decades have seen various attempts by former patients and their families to hold the Canadian government and the Central Intelligence Agency accountable. In 1992, the Canadian government, which had provided grants from several agencies to fund Cameron's research, offered compensation of 100,000 Canadian dollars to 77 former patients of the Institute who had been reduced to a childlike state. Hundreds of others, including Steele's mother, were denied compensation, at times because they were deemed not to have been damaged enough by the experiments. Steele, who launched a legal challenge against the government in 2015, settled years later with the federal government receiving a $100,000 payment in exchange for signing a non-disclosure agreement. The settlement was one of a handful made in recent years, said the lawyer Alan Stein, who has represented several former patients and their families. The Canadian government, while not fully aware of the extent of the experiments being carried out at the time, said the payments to former patients were made on compassionate and humanitarian grounds, said Stein. It never admitted its legal responsibility. In 1980, Johnson's grandmother and eight former patients took on the CIA, took on the CIA, launching a class action lawsuit over the six years of funded it had provided to Cameron. The legal challenge left her grandmother fighting anxiety and panic attacks. She was summoned as difficult as it was every bit of her energy and courage and step out and face it. After originally asking for one million US dollars each in damages and a public apology, the plaintiffs settled in 1988 with each of them receiving a parsley $80,000. Do not for a moment believe these types of experiments are over and done. They are more clandestine than ever, being conducted in friendly countries with no human rights. Think of one with a red flag. We have been fed a narrative of outrage, a constant diet of outrage. Every week it's something new to be outraged about and yet, we have made our elected leaders and their institution off topic, off limits. We have considered them civilized. They are civilized, as civilized as cannibals eating with forks and knives. Now you just sit there quietly and cooperate. Movies like The Manchurian yes, Candidate stoked fears of a new communist weapon, brainwashing. The CIA wanted to understand more about brainwashing. It had money and it was ready to fund experiments. And that's what led it here to the Allen Memorial Institute then one of the most prestigious psychiatric hospitals in Canada, and its director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. These are the days and hours are the occasion. Cameron's patients, many of them women with postpartum depression, became guinea pigs in an experiment called depatterning, breaking down the mind with repeated electric shocks and drugs, including massive doses of LSD. He 
he took my mother away from me. Alison Steele was four when her mother Jean fell into a depression. And we have pictures of her skiing, horseback riding, always a smile, happy, a, a person that I didn't know. I never saw my mother this way. 60 years after her mother's treatment, Alison Steele finally has her medical records. This is where I got to know my mother. What happened to her, the horror that she went through. Pacing the hall this morning saying, I'm just a prisoner. I feel like Jesus on the cross can feel the nails in my hands and feet. It's just like being buried alive. Somebody, please do something. Jean Steele was kept in a drug-induced coma for weeks. Her brain repeatedly shocked. Dr. Cameron broke her down, but wasn't able to put her back together. So I just learned over time to not talk to her because I knew she couldn't. So that made me angry. In the 90s, the government of Canada, which also funded Cameron's experiments, compensated several dozen patients, but only those who had been completely depatterned, reduced to incontinence, unable to tie shoelaces. Jean Steele wasn't damaged enough, so she and hundreds more received nothing. These experiments were done without the informed consent of the patients. Lawyer Alan Stein took up some of the rejected cases. The government's paid a number of settlements since, including $100,000 for Alison Steele. Many of the payments come with non-disclosure agreements. They're trying to do it quietly. It's not fair. I mean, I feel, I feel blessed that I was able to get this far for my parents. I, I really do. That's what gives me justice. I'm just grateful to be able to do it, and I hope you, I, I just hope that uh, you can hear me up there because it might bring you peace. It might bring you both peace.